Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I've got, we've got quite a lot of sofas here, so I feel as though you guys are quite far yeah. away, far apart. So we'll try and make this as cozy and as comfortable as possible. So um, um, I was just introduced. So my name is Suki Jutla, and I'm the co-founder and the COO of Market Orders. We are a marketplace where we help um, small enterprises to purchase gold, jewelry, and diamonds directly from manufacturers abroad. And today's panel, we're actually going to be speaking about um, how innovation is being used in e-commerce today. So it, it's not good enough anymore just to have um, an online presence or have a mobile app, because brick and mortar stores are also sort of trying to think about how we can actually compete with online stores. So today I've got a wonderful panel with me, and they're actually a mixture of brick and mortar stores and online, uh, online businesses. So um, I'm, I was just telling these guys I won't get too controversial and say which is better, but we're going to talk more about how businesses, both on and offline, can use innovation to drive customer traction. So just to introduce, we've got Andreas Noor from Expedia, and we've got um, Janice Thomas from Birchbox, which is an online beauty business. So you guys are completely online. And Expedia, I think a lot of people have probably used Expedia, online travel company. Um, then we have Natalie Haig from Mercury One, which is an enterprise software company. And you guys are also online. And then we have the lovely Corin Mills, who is from Dixon's Carphone Warehouse. And you guys have a mix of uh, online, store, online presence and in-store shops as well. So I guess my first question is, you know, 10 years ago, when there was just mainly brick and mortar stores, um, everyone was sort of getting excited about the internet and the go-to sort of solution to, have an, uh, to be embracing the internet was to have an online presence. And this was typically just a website and a mobile app. So my question to you guys is, in today's world, how are businesses having to go beyond that and innovate? Do you want to take that question, Janice? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the most important thing is con customer centricity. Sorry, con customer centricity and understanding what your customer wants and your customer chances are wants a convenient experience that fits their needs. And I think um, personalization is becoming increasingly important, whether you're online or offline. And I think that's where we're going to see um, the key developments in the coming years, particularly with the development of AI, enables you to give true one-to-one -one personalization, which is interestingly going back to the old days of retail, when your local retailer actually used to know you as a, as a human being and, a, and you used to have that direct relationship. Great. And do you have anything to add, Andreas? So for Expedia, you guys are completely online. You don't have in-store shops. What does innovation mean to Expedia today? Yeah, so I would say the interesting thing about Expedia is actually 20 years old, or I think 21 now, actually. So really, when the internet started you know, to become more commercial, Expedia turned around the panel from, let's say, a traditional travel agent who would make recommendations for you to empowering consumers to make recommendations on their own. Um, forward 20, 20 years further, you know, that kind of is, has become a commodity. You can do that you know, with many of our competitors to varying degrees and you know, often with many of the you know, hotel or airline partners that we work with as well. So for us, really, um, I think one of the big assets is you know, the amount of data that, that we have as a global company. And that amount of data, if you just take a flight from London to, let's say, Mallorca today, there's over, there's probably a billion combinations of how you can get there on that journey if you combine everything. And you know, we're able to synthesize that data. And I, I expect you know, in the next couple of years, personalization will become much better than where we are today. And I think that's, that's one example, you know, just to add on to your point, where you know, moving from, from a billion combinations to something that actually is useful for you as a family versus a business traveler versus maybe a single traveler, uh, where we can do much better than we do today. Great. So I love that you just mentioned the um, customization element. So it's no longer good enough for a customer just to walk in and businesses to expect to take their money. So my next question, I'd like to direct to Corin actually. What, are, what is Dixon's Carphone Warehouse doing to provide a more personalized service for customers? Because you know a customer can look for products online, they can search for stuff, they can just order it online. What's the incentive for them to come in store and, and, and to see your lovely face. <laughs> um, not, well, um, so I think the focus has to be uh, like has shifted in the last couple of years, maybe longer than that actually, in that 
customers now come in doing the research and it's not a linear journey. Everyone thinks that they kind of, it kind of flipped this period where they were like, right, they start online, then they go in store, then they buy the thing, and then it's not like that. They're online in the store, and then they go home, and then they buy online, and then there might be an issue, and they come back in store. And I, I think the big thing that we're looking at and we need to really focus on is understanding that the journey is never linear. Mm -hmm. And actually, personalization, the first step is making sure that we're not repeating ourselves, we're not giving something to a customer that they've already found out themselves, that our staff have as much information as that customer, which is really hard with the complexity of thousands of tech products in one store, that's for Curry's PC World. So the big focus on personalization for us is to make sure it matches the customer journey, because I think it's very easy to overcomplicate things and use these interesting data sets you've got, and then say this targeted message here, and really do it, but then if you just put that out individually in each channel, you're just repeating yourself. So the big thing on personalization is matching it to the customer journey, the true one. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm. so I'd like to move across to Janice uh, and touch upon that personalized element. So Birchbox does beauty box subscriptions. So, you know, beauty products are, are very personalized products. So what is Birchbox doing to ensure you're giving your customized, uh, customers a, a, a customized experience? Well, that's interestingly the main differentiator that we offer as a business in the UK, that we offer a personalized service. So when you join, you tell us about your skin, your hair, your sense of style, and then we send you specific products based on your needs. Um, and the key part of the service is its discovery. You never know what you're going to get. It's like a present to yourself um, in the post every month. And you might get a, a product that you're not familiar with using. So we provide you with education, both in the box, through our social channels, and all of those things, explaining what this product is, how you can use it, so that you can really discover things that you probably wouldn't have gone into a shop to buy. Because let's face it, if you've been going into Boots for years buying the same conditioner for five pounds, you're not going to buy one suddenly that's 35 pounds unless you've tried it and you've seen what an amazing difference it makes to your specific hair type. Great. OK. So, um, Natalie, I'd like to move across to you. So just before we came, uh, came onto the stage, you were telling me um, you guys help to develop apps and online presence for uh, mainly startups. And you said that the number one request you normally get from startups is, oh, I need a mobile app. And your question back to them is, why? So can you tell me a little bit more about why you would respond like that? Because isn't that how companies can innovate? And doesn't everyone need a mobile app today? I would say about 80% of our customer base um, don't have a mobile app. So they, they simply utilize the internet and use their websites to capture people. Um, and the rest of their clients come to me and say, I really want a mobile app. I really need it. And you say, well, well why do you need it? Like, what are you trying to do with that mobile app? Um, come, someone came to me the other day and said, I want to capture the African hairstyle audience. And I want them to find the best salons in London to try and do their hair. And I said, that's great. What's your target audience? How are you trying to reach them? He said, right, I want a mobile app. So do you think someone's going to go into Google and say, right, African hairstyle stylists? They're not going to look for that. They're going to go to Google Maps. They're going to go and ask their friends. So you need to look where your target audience is looking for their client base. And that's where you need to target. And Google Maps or Google Places would be the best place to do that. And it isn't going to be a mobile app, because no one's going to go into a Play Store and look for that app. So that's my advice, is like understand why, understand who, and understand where they are looking for you. So would you say um, data is also an important element in that? Yeah, totally. You need to collect data on your client, and you need to profile your client to understand where they're looking for your product. Mm -hmm. OK, wonderful. OK, so um, there was some data that basically shows that 88% um, of shopping in the UK is still done um, in brick and mortar stores. And I found that quite shocking. I thought everything had pretty much moved online. And I think every year, they're always predicting the demise of um, the high street, right? So we had um, a couple of uh, stores that went down, Mothercare, House of Fraser as well, which was a huge shock. So this is an open question to, you, to, to any of you guys. Do you really think that there will ever be a point in time where the high street will die down and everything will go online? I'll, I mean, again, it's hard to predict the future. I would never dare to. But I would say it will look very different to today. If you take um, the travel agency businesses, right? I mean, and we work with about 60,000 worldwide, so we have a pretty good uh, view of, of how they've been um, flourishing and others have been shutting down. 
And you take the UK, I mean, I think just in the last five years, over a thousand travel agencies have closed the door forever. Um, however, there's other travel agencies that have just started up. And why are they so successful? I think there are two things. The first is they provide a very specialized service. So they're very good at one thing. And they do that and they're known for that. So it could be complex, round the world travel. It could be, you know, um, I'm just a very good place to go if you're a family. Something that's very specialized, right? And um, I think the other ones are just very good humans. And I think one thing that we do miss online, and I, I think our own site is, is a good example of how we're trying to get better, but we're not there, is personal touch, a personal contact with other humans. I think that'll become increasingly important, and I think we're already seeing evidence of that. And um, so someone who just is very warm and is, is welcoming and you know knows that has a personal relationship, I don't see that going away. And I think today's um, you know, forum here is, is a good example of that. Okay. Janice, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are certain things that are always going to be physical stores. I mean, you're not going to suddenly start um, ordering your lunchtime sandwich on the internet. You know, th th there are certain things where clearly a physical store is more convenient. But it is that um, deep relationship, the, the areas where you do want to have a conversation with someone that you don't actually potentially want to spend the time and effort that it takes to research online, that you know that you can just go in store and ask someone who is a genuine expert that you can trust. And Natalie, do you have any comments on that? Because you guys are a completely online um, presence. And in fact, you work in Spain, <laughs> right? And you literally just came in for this conference. So what's, what's your uh, opinions on that? I mean, our company is completely remote. About 50% of the team I haven't even met. So we actually work really well together just through the chat. Um, and utilizing online tools that let you do task management, et cetera, and tracking people's work, which is always fun. Um, but I, I would say for me, having, like, having the advantage of meeting together is, is really critical. And I think that's something that um, this weekend, actually, we're doing a voluntary weekend where we go to charity and we build something for young people. And for me, that get together is super vital. We, we learn a lot about each other. We improve our teamwork. And we, we learn a bit more about how we can utilize the tools. So I think for me, that face-to-face -face contact with people is still vital. And I think you, know, you bring in augmented reality um, and you bring your, your stores and augmented reality together with the virtual world. And I think that's where you've got your winning combination. People can try products, people can test things out in a physical space, but still use all of the data from online. Right. And Corin, um, you know, Dixon's and Carphone Warehouse merged a few years back. Yeah. Sometimes I think that was a critical point in their business. They could have just scrapped all the stores on the high street and just gone completely online. So what's your uh, opinions on that? Why do you think it's still so important to have those um, on store, in, in brick and mortar stores? Um, I suppose, firstly, I think a lot of the the companies that either struggle or disappear. It's not just because they've got stores. I think it goes back to what you are doing, what's your purpose as a business. And I think the relevancy of that is the fundamental thing. Um, how you then bring that to life, obviously you have a choice to make from where you've come from, what you've got, um, what you want to do, what's your expertise. And I, I think for us, um, the, the clear thing for the future is, is making sure there's a clear role in each of the channels. Mm. and understanding that this is not about saying we prefer customers to shop online for this and we'd like them to come in store for that. It doesn't work that way. It's about giving a customer the choice, making it as seamless as possible, which is complex when you've got so many systems, but you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to me, the reason why stores are massively relevant in anything is that it gives the customer more choice and it allows you to give them a wider range of experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think a true omni-channel retailer, and I don't think there's really anyone who's cracked this yet, but that's kind of what everyone's racing towards, mm -hmm. will be in a very good position. You know, our biggest strength online is the fact we have stores. And our biggest strength in stores is the fact that we've got online. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what we have to really leverage. Um, but it really goes back to your business model, right? That's, that's why you're here, being relevant, and that, that's the key bit. Um, so do you find that the online presence complements your brick and mortar stores and which one is more powerful in driving sales and yeah. customers? Um, it really depends. Like we, we, um, so what, just, I'm just, one example, um, Carphone Warehouse, it's actually quite a complex sell, right? It's very complex to get into a personalized, like how much tariffs they need, data and that sort of thing. But the reassurance of having a store and a person there who's enabled by technology to do that quickly 
because they can't do it on their own either. They need the technology, the staff, is a massive benefit. And that's kind of our focus there, if that, that kind of starts to answer that. So it's, it's not, it goes back to choice, sorry. I think that's the key thing. We the choice, yep. Yeah. OK. So I'm really happy you mentioned experiences and choices. So the other day, I asked my nephew, who's um, 18, I said, what did you do yesterday? And he said, I did Uber Eats at lunchtime, and then I did Deliveroo at, uh, during dinner, and then I Netflixed and Amazon Primed. <laughs> so I think uh, that probably makes sense to us, but I think his mom was just thinking, I don't understand what my son really talks about these days. So we've got a huge um, strata of um, young millennials now who are literally doing everything on their phones. They expect to do things on their phones because it's just easier to do. So my question to, to the panel is, how are you engaging these young millennials who are, you know, they're, they're used to these uh, online experiences. How can you bring that uh, better experience to them? And if you've got online uh, brick and mortar shops, how are you bringing younger generation into your stores? I'll go for it. Um, yeah, okay. so um, I suppose the big focus here isn't necessarily, it, it works across the board. Everybody is now online. It's not one mindset of one generation or that sort of thing. Except I think, my grandpa, he's not online. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, it goes back to product groups for us. So if you're, it, it really depends on what they're buying. And if they're buying something now, people are a lot more comfortable buying something that they've never seen or touched before. And that's actually a, a great thing for the consumer. So we just facilitate that. Um, how are we targeting them? It's to make sure that if they do come into a store, it's relevant. It's relevant to their journey and what they want and why they've come into that store. So again, it goes back to having a very clear role for that store and communicating that. Um, it also goes back to online, not worrying, not not going like, actually, we don't want you to come in store. You know, just stay online and that sort of thing. So not breaking down those barriers and just opening up. And lastly, being a lot more comfortable. There used to be a thing in retail, it was like the glory days when there was a thing called like, oh, that's bad footfall, that's bad people coming in the shops, they're the wrong people. Like, forget all of that. This is about actually, DPD pickup in our stores is a great thing. You know, convenience, leverage that convenience as well as that experience. And so being more open to any sort of footfall and then giving them a great experience. Okay, so I'd like to jump across to Andreas and just leading on what Corin said. So Expedia, loads of youngsters use it to book their flights and you know hotels and things like that. So what is Expedia doing today to have that added experience that their customers are looking for? So you know, I would it's say it's just like yeah. going beyond just booking the hotel. But what happens after that? What are the experiences yeah. that you're you're adding? So. I'm afraid I will have to bore the audience on that one. Um, it is a really hard problem just to do the first part of, of what you just said. So actually just to have a seamless booking experience mm -hmm. where you know, we're in an industry where I mentioned already the data that we receive from many of our systems, they change billions of times a day. Mm -hmm. And the millennial, of course, doesn't care about any of that. He wants instant information for what he's looking for, what his friends are looking for right now. So just solving that problem, that's the first step for us. And um, one example is just this week, actually, we've rolled out 100% our new hotel path on, on, on mobile, which always loads under three seconds all over the world. Like for us to get to that point took us a year. But we, we know, I mean, we, we have all the evidence in the world, a millennial or anyone else, they're not going to wait five, 10 seconds for a result, right? So those are what I would call hygiene factors. And then next to that, we've done a lot of um, research around our millennial audience and, and really, there's a much bigger openness to, to using their data for purposes that will help them. So both sharing with their friends, 70% of millennials, I believe, in, in travel are heavily influenced by their friends, right? So us offering things like sharing itineraries by you know, connecting with other friends and, and their itineraries, those are kind of things we're thinking about there right now. Um, and then just person, more personalized again. So, so a millennial just, you know, if you look at the best in class examples from Uber to um, Tinder, I guess, and other ones, you know, they have very, very personalized experiences. And, you know, we've just been a very generic shop because it's, it's a complicated problem. And I think now we're at the stage we can start to narrow it down. That's awesome. And I love the fact that you said that the pages have to load under three seconds. So I think there was some recent uh, research that showed that the average um, attention span of a human is eight seconds yes. and that of a goldfish is something like nine seconds now. So I think maybe next year you guys will try to beat that and go to two seconds. <laughs> yeah, I think the other challenge we have, and I think many of us uh, in different industries have, is that 
we actually we have a we have a, um, a, s a studio where we actually measure um, more uh, different levels of chemical uh, changes in the brain when people are using our products. And what we found is that it's extremely boring. People find using our site quite boring, right? When they go on to, again, when they go on to Tinder or they go on to uh, Candy Crunch, you know, it spikes. So, so some of the challenges we have is how do we make it more exciting as well at the same time and, and, pr and probably more also inspiring, right? Especially in the travel space, which, which is a, so mm. fun. Yeah, you have to focus on user experience, and I think yeah. you do that through focus groups, working with um, different people who are your audience, and also, like, a bit controversial here, but diversity in tech is super important, lots of different ways of thinking about it, lots of different ways of approaching, and the more diversity you have in the technical environment, the better your user experience will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've spoken a lot about user experiences and giving customized um, experiences. So the only way to do that really is to understand who your customer is. And the only way you can do that is to collect data. So uh, we're not going to talk about GDPR. I think everyone's pretty bored of that. So how are you guys in your businesses using data to drive these insights? And how are you making sure that you're also respecting the customers and making sure you're not sharing too much? I mean, how do you? find that balance? I think being very transparent with your customers is really important that we um, actually quite a long way ahead of um, GDPR about 18 months ago, um, we um, really overhauled how we talked to customers about how we were going to use their data. And we said things like, we're going to send you a special offer on your birthday. Um, you're going to be able to, if you're a subscriber, you'll have early access to our limited edition boxes. And actually, just that transparency by being specific about what we were going to send people massively increased our opt-in rates just because we were being transparent with people. And that was actually way ahead of GDPR. And I think the big thing there is it's not, it's beneficial to both. It's not a volumes number. It's like you want the right sort of, I said there's no such thing as bad football a minute ago, but there is such thing as bad kind of customer sets who just, just ticked a box without realizing what it is and will never look or interact with you again. And yeah, yeah it's really important to do. You want the right customer, not just mm. a customer. Yeah. Mm. Do you have any further comments on that? Andrew? Yeah, no, I would just say if uh, we, we talked again about the uh, millennial generation, just they have certain expectations and, and they're okay sharing data more often than, than previous generations. And um, the second thing is, you know, most of our sales for a lot of companies now happen over small, you know, mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And the challenge we have is, you know, in complex products, there would usually be a lot of million ways you can filter and sort, and we just don't have that luxury anymore with little space. So. The challenge, I guess, on top of that is, is, is to really you know, use data to provide more tailor-made, if you will, or fine-tuned search results. So, so basically that, OK, the hotel list, as an example, that you receive is slightly different maybe than the one that a family receives versus a business traveler versus a student, right? And if we can do that, then, then actually we can, we can use our data in such a way that, that the consumer understands is adding value to him as well. Great. Yeah. So I'd like to now move on to the um, experiential economy now. So we do have customers, and you know, myself included, um, sometimes it's, it's more fun to book an Airbnb in a, a random castle than it is to get a room in a Premier Inn. <laughs> so in your businesses, um, how has the shift moved to just um, supplying the product to the customer, but now to adding experiences? Can you share any insights into how your businesses are, are have that experiential factor, so a customer might be willing to pay more just for that experience. Do you have any insights on that that you can share? Well, certainly um, from a Birchbox perspective, that's something that we experimented with late last year, that we did a pop-up shop on Carnaby Street to have people um, kind of, they actually built their own box from scratch and decided which products to, to go in it. And for us, it was an interesting, as you say, it was an experiential moment. And we said, right, that's a short-term thing. And, you know, this time, you know, at the end of this year, we're going to do something else different to have that same thing. How do you bring the brand to life? OK. Um, how about yourself, Andrea? So Expedia is completely online. Uh, you, you can, is online the only way you can provide these experiential experiences? Or is there anything else that Expedia is doing? No, definitely not. I mean, at first, I would say to your point on Airbnb is, you know, we, we believe, you know, we've moved away from calling ourselves a hotel provider. We, we 
have over a million uh, vacation rentals, as an example, now within the portfolio, and we aim to have everything where you can sleep, you know, uh, any possible combination. So we're definitely broadening our horizons very quickly there. Um, but from a, from a distribution perspective, um, We've actually, you know, the, the, the luxury that we have a little bit is that we can always dabble in, in a lot of new technologies and, and make, mis mis make mistakes early on. So, so we, we do have some prototypes in virtual reality. In fact, we've demoed one where, you know, you can be in a hotel room in Vegas and you can throw things around the room and you can gamble and do all kinds of stuff you're not allowed to do <laughs> usually, which is kind of fun. Um, but we also, you know, have launched a voice version of our site as well. So. Um, we are entering different, you know, um, technologies as they emerge. It's always, you know, very complicated to figure out how you could become, how you can really make it in such a way that adds value to the consumer, of course. But, you know, I think allowing ourselves to experiment early on is what we're trying to do. Okay. So we've spoken a lot about, um, you know, the experiences that customers need uh, and that they want, but there's also an important element of trust now. Customers want to know that the, the products they're buying are coming from trusted suppliers. So in your businesses, how are you making sure that you've, you've, you are increasing, you've got innovative practices in your supply chain? How are you communicating that to your customers that everything is, you know, sort of legit and transparent? And you know, there is a huge uh, interest and rise in blockchain technology now. Um, there's a high street shop, a store called Lush Cosmetics, that last year started to take payments in in blockchain, in Bitcoin, um, just to make sure that they could track the, tran uh, the the transactions. And they also started to pay their farmers using uh, cryptocurrencies because what they found was uh, many of their farmers were. Only getting paid six months down the line because their banks were holding the cash. And then as soon as Lush Cosmetics switched over to cryptocurrency, the farmers were now being, being paid within you know, a couple of minutes. And that, although it might sound like a small thing, it was huge because it now meant that these farmers could take that money and invest it into their businesses and buy food for their, for their families and send their children to school. So are any of your businesses embracing blockchain technology? Have you thought about doing cryptocurrencies? And how does that all fit into the whole innovation strategy in your businesses? Do you want to start, uh, Andreas? Let's I mean, sure. I mean, we, we have um, Bitcoin in the US side, so we've, we've dabbled with it. It's off currently, but it'll be on again and uh, totally open to it. I think blockchain itself, we, we've built a working team to kind of decide, because a lot of our competitors, especially from the offline space, have created headlines by saying blockchain is going to kill the likes of Expedia and its rivals. And, you know, we're not panicked by these statements, but we do want to, you know, have a deep understanding. So, so you know, we are looking at the, especially at the hotel supply chain that we have and understanding is there area, are there areas that can add value to that chain? And for sure there will be. There'll be areas that will make our process of payments, to your point, or process of, you know, technology, of processing the individual bookings very, very uh, seamless compared to how they are now, right? So today we have, you know, over 4,000 people who are you know, basically responsible for their whole relationship with our you know, currently about 800,000 self-contracted um, hotel supply partners, right, as an example. And I, I do envisage that area is going to get much more efficient for us. So that's interesting. So you guys have already started to use blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Well, crypto, yes. Blockchain, okay. like I said, we're, we're only, um, we have a team trying to understand, like, is there something we can do, you know, leveraging it um, to, to, to improve our, our value chain towards the hotel partners? Okay. Yeah. And have you, uh, do you have any insights to share about the um, transactions that were taking place using cryptos? So, for example, with Lush Cosmetics, what they found was when they were trialing this system over a three-month period, um, the, the transaction volumes were, were larger, so the customers were buying more with cryptocurrency, there were, there were less refunds, and they found that there was a more a repeat purchase. So they actually said that it was, um, the, the more loyal customers were those using cryptos, and I know sometimes crypto has bad, uh, a bad reputation, um, but they, they didn't know why that was, or maybe there's just uh, some crypto people love uh, uh, smelly soaps, you know, nice smelling soaps. So do you have any insights to share with, uh, about Expedia, about, you know, what are those transactions looking like, um, and, and any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, um, what we have seen, it was a very small share of our overall transactions, unfortunately, still. I mean, we had a live now for about two years. Okay. And um, very, very small, but to your point, you know, because perhaps it's a more targeted audience who really love the fact that, hey, we actually offer this, 
the purchase frequency has been above average for sure. Um, okay. But again, the, the uptake is so small that unfortunately it's still negligible. I personally am a big believer in some future with, you know, with, with crypto. I just don't know what that future looks like, but I'm, I, I do believe we have to stay on the ball. Yeah, so I, I'm passionate about blockchain technology and cryptos. Um, so in my business, Market Orders, we are actually helping supply um, the high street, uh, high street jewelers with uh, the products that they need. And what we do is we help them to bypass the middlemen and go directly to the manufacturers. And um, we're actually helping them to do that on an online, online system and using blockchain. And you know, the gold industry is so old, it's very traditional, it's about 90, you know, I think 4% of gold jewelry is actually sold online. So there's, there's a huge potential and scope to do something different. Uh, and I think that, that shift is happening, but you just don't know where it's going to lead, but it's very uh, exciting spaces to be in. Um, so Janice, I'd just like to come across to you. Have, has Birchbox thought about taking payments in crypto cash? Um, to be fair, Birchbox in the UK is a relatively small business. We have about 40 um, full-time staff in total, so it's not top of the agenda from a UK perspective at the moment. Okay. Um, Natalie, do you have any comments? No, it's not something we've been involved in. AI, yes. Crypto, no. <laughs> so you, you are looking into AI. Yeah. So do you want to share some insights about how Mercury is using AI? Yeah, it's something that's really applicable to some of our edtech customers, um, where you can use it to, to kind of churn your data to understand how you do better matching algorithms. So you can match tutors to students, for example, and that's a really interesting area that we're going to use it in. So it's, it's kind of coming back to the personalization, like properly personalizing. You're this student, and you want to study maths, and this tutor is perfect because they're also at Oxford where you want to go, and they've studied this in the, in the past. And so it's like really personalizing the journey through searching algorithms. Mm -hmm. That's cool. OK. So Corin, so two questions. Um, how, how are you guys implementing blockchain, crypto, and AI. So how do you see that as part of Dixon's Carphone Warehouse strategy going forward? Um, so when it comes to kind of the technology we sell, we're at quite the, the front end. We have to sell all the latest stuff and look at that innovation. But in terms of that from a customer need, that's not on our agenda in terms of the cryptocurrency blockchain, just because it's not relevant to our audience and our sales and our business. Now, there is areas that we are, you know, the digital team are constantly reviewing and looking. Um, from an AI point of view, that's slightly different. Um, there's the big thing you have with the modern complexity of multi-channels and personalization is just the sheer volume. Mm. You know, it's great having 50 different customer sets, but then you've got to tailor make 50 different messages. And there comes a point where it's a volumes issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the area of biggest interest and where we're really looking at, which is if you can, if we, we've got the data and we can know who we're talking to, it's the ability to then know, understand what message we want to serve those individual customers. That legwork there, that thinking, that's the bit that's a real big challenge for any business, no matter what size or scale, actually. Just to, you know, and then there's no point having 50 different customers and then serving them the same thing because, or three things because you've got this. So that's the area where we're looking to most capitalize on AI, which is the decision-making process in how we serve marketing. Great. OK. So we have just a few more minutes. So my, my closing question, I guess, is to all of you guys. Um, 10 years ago, if we'd have this conversation and I asked you, what does innovation mean to your businesses? The answer would probably have been, have an online presence and have a mobile app. Now, going forward in the next 10 to 15 years, how, what do you think that innovation is going to look like in, in your businesses? So just a quick fire round. And we'll start off with yourself, Andreas. So I'm really privileged to work in travel, which is a beautiful business. Um, I think you know it brings the world closer together. Um, and I think, without doubt, with AI and VR in some format, we'll be able to bring travel experiences home. And perhaps people can trial where they're going to go or what they can maybe never afford in their life, but at least they can actually trial it at home without having to go there. And then. You know, I think that, that whole area will, will, will really change very quickly with uh, a lot of the, um, the tech startups also, that, some of which are even here at the conference, I think. So for travel, I think that'll be a big area. Cool. Janice? Yeah, so our, our vision statement for the company is um, forever useful, always delightful. And so for us, it's really about elevating that customer experience. Mm -hmm. Great. Natalie? I mean, I think, like myself, there's going to be a massive increase in digital nomads. And I think the future of innovation will be targeting the digital nomads and giving them an experience where they're working from home anywhere, and they have whatever they want when they want it. 
Wonderful. And Corinne? Um, not specific technology. I think it's more the customer needs are going to shift massively in the future. And I think it goes back to the three-second payment. It's that frictionless world that we, we all want, and we all want to, we need to embrace that. So more frictionless world across the channels and really dialing up that personalized experience. That's great. Thank you so much. So um, I'd just like to thank my panel. I, I, my name is Suki Jutla, and I've been your host today. And I'd just like to thank my panel, Andreas, Janice, Natalie, and Corinne. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.